Welcome to the final November edition of A Closer Look. I'm Mark Shine with my good friend Mark Miller. We survived Thanksgiving. The Miller family yes, we the did. same. Oh, it was a good one. Yeah, really good. Ate a lot of food. Ate a lot, of, food. a lot of football. I was wondering if we were going to have to put a wide angle lens up here <laughs> to get us both in, but apparently not. Well, no. we've got uh, a lot of things to do today. We've actually lengthened our show to a full 30 minutes today to cover lots of things. And we're going to start, Mark, with a review and a preview yeah. of some things in football. All right. Well, you and I were able to do Marion Local and Liberty right. Benton down at Wapak last week in the semifinals. And that team that won, of course, Marion Local, ranked number one, 14 and 0. They're going to play against the number two ranked team. Kirtland, they're also at 14-0. They play at 10 o'clock Saturday at Tom Benson Hall of Fame Stadium in Canton. Kirtland got there by beating Nelsonville York in the semis 44-0. They have two running backs on the second team all Ohio, two in the same backfield. That means they like to run the football. This is their sixth championship game in the last seven years, so this is no stranger to them. They were state champs in 2011, 2013, 2015. You get the odd year mm -hmm. kind of flow going. They beat in 2015, they beat Marion Local 22 to 20. Of course, Marion Local beat Liberty Benton 31-13 on the game we were talking about. Their 71 playoff wins is number one in the state of Ohio. Doesn't matter what division you're talking about. They have nine state championships. That defense gives up 5.9 yeah. points a game. Kirtland's offense averages 42.3 points a game. Something's got to give. I put my money on the defense. Yeah, I, I like the Flyers. Tim Goodwin's there, yeah. back in Canton. They're going to eat at that Amish restaurant over there on yeah. the west of Canton, and they'll have a good trip. Hopefully I, bring I, back a champion. I volunteered to go over and cover it. The, uh, the meal, the post-game meal <laughs> yeah. in Mrs. Joder's kitchen, and Andy didn't respond, so you know how that goes. Well, I've got Minster, and they beat Norwalk St. Paul. That's an upset a lot of us didn't really look at it and think, I don't think that's going to happen. Norwalk St. Paul came in ranked number one, but Minster dominated the game, won 40 to 7. The quarterback, Jared Hillsman, 44 carries, 271 yards, five touchdowns. He was also 11 of 16 throwing the football, had a touchdown there. That went to Schmiesing. Eight, Schmiesing got eight catches in that game, and they just dominated St. Paul. Held them to 216 yards total. They had been averaging over 445 yards per game, just 43 yards rushing the football. They did a great job. Uh, Minster back in the state finals again this year after a loss last year to Warren JFK. This time they get Cuyahoga Heights, who's 12-1. and one. They are there somewhat uh, kind of fluke way, if you want to think about it, in week three in the regional finals. They defeated Dalton 42-41. Mark, they're down 41-35 with 27 seconds left and don't have the ball. Mm. Dalton fumbled, long pass, five-yard touchdown run, and they're in the finals in the state semis. They defeated Danville 38-8. They've got a couple of great running backs, a 6'2", 220-pound second team all Ohio, Lucas Diorzino. They're very good at running the football. This will be a great matchup. A lot of all Ohio players for Cuyahoga Heights. Um, three on defense, two on offense. It's a very solid football team. But right now, the Minster Wildcats are playing extremely well, and we'll see, see what happens with that particular game. And that one loss that Cuyahoga Heights has is to Kirtland. The team that's that right. Marion Local's that's playing. That's right, the team that Marion yeah. Local's playing. And they're both in the same league, just yes, like sir. the MAC is in the same conference uh, with Marion Local and Minster. So a lot of big football, of course, on Friday at 10 and on Saturday at 10. Uh, MAC team's playing, and they're matching up with teams from the northeastern part of the state. Well, we wanted to do this before we wrapped up our football season, do a couple of more things. The first thing we want to look at is who are the conference players of the year and coaches of the year. And we'll kind of put those up on the screen here. We'll kind of go through this a little bit, and you can see who did extremely well in their conferences. Well, in the Midwest Athletic Conference, Tim Goodwin from Marion Local, that undefeated thing, playing in the state championship yet again. Offensive player of the year, Will Holman, the great running back from Fort Recovery, and defensive player of the year, Curtis Richling from Versailles, the linebacker, defensive back type. Um, boy, there's a lot of good players in that league, so to get those awards are pretty important. Yeah, Chris Algie gets Coach of the Year in the BVC, and what a job he did with so many guys who graduated from a year ago. And then Austin May and A.J. Dobbins from Liberty Benton, the offensive and defensive players of the year in that conference. Northwest Conference, Coach Chris Summers from Spencerville, got it at Def Jefferson, just moves over, something about great coaches, right? Offensive Player of the Year, Drew Klein, the quarterback out of Crestview, and the Defensive Player of the Year, Chase Sumner, the defensive back from Ada. Okay, let's move on then to the Western Buckeye League, and they do things a little bit differently. The Offensive Player of the Year, at least as a back, was Isaac McAdams, Garrett Loth, the uh, offensive lineman. 
Cole Merlin, defensive back of the year, defensive lineman Reed Aller, and Noah Adcock, the kicker of the year in that conference. And of course, a great job by all the coaching staff in there, and, and especially down there, Coach Fry down there at St. Mary's. NWCC, Coach Luke Taviano just recently named the state coach of the year in that division. Offensive player of the year, Owen Smith from Lehman Catholic, and the fine linebacker, Colton Keith from USV, the defensive player of the year. And finally, the track, Coach Ken Winters, and the championship in the track uh, from Whitmer. Player of the year offensively was Riley Keller, the quarterback from Whitmer, and the defensive player of the year, DeMarco Craig from Toledo Central Catholic. And Mark, uh, our final football question mark of the year. Here's the emphasis, the best player you saw. Now, we know lots of guys around. We don't get a chance to see all right. of them. Best player you saw this year play. Well, you and I did a lot of MAC games. We, we went south, and so that's kind of our point of reference a little bit. But I think any of those players of the year you have to consider as one of the better players we've seen all year, and there's a lot of good ones. I think also some All-Staters that maybe not were not players of the year. I think of Chase Sumner from Ada and Jared Brees from uh, Pandora Gilboa. And then I got to give some love to the linemen. I thought there were some great linemen this year. Start, it's off, starts off with John Dirksen down at Marion Local, the two-way guy, Thomas Schwederman from Coldwater, Abe Wildermuth from Anna, a couple of big guys that have motors that just run constantly, were great leaders. But the best player that I saw, Will Homan from Fort Recovery, Player of the Year in the MAC and in the state in Division VI, set rushing records in Mercer County, plays offense, plays defense, plays special teams. He is a special, special player. Not the biggest player you're going to want to see, but I'd take that kid on my team any day at any level. He's going to get on the field and play. Yeah, I was going to come here and say, okay, I'm going to disagree with you and pick somebody else, but not this time. You just can't <laughs> do that. Will Holman had a great year, so did his football team at Fort Recovery. And at 5'7", and listed at, what, 180 or whatever, his leg yeah. strength, his stamina, had an outstanding year for them. Well, let's move on now, and let's look at a couple of bright spots. And the first thing we want to do is, we want to say congratulations and thank you to our broadcast crews. Now, you know, we don't get a chance to you know, see Mark and I on the air or some of our other on-air personality personalities, I guess we have those. Yeah, yeah. But we got a lot of guys behind the scenes who've done a lot of nice stuff for us this year. Starting out in the hot weather, they go through thunderstorms, they go through mm -hmm. you know, all the winter weather we had there for a while, and that cold rainy night week 10. Terrible. This is our look of our, our guys who put all of our stuff together from our camera crews, the guys at the top who are producers and directors, they're in the truck, they edit for us, and we just want to say thank you to all of you people who help make our broadcast crews go so well this year. Yeah, they make it really easy on us. Mark and I do a little homework on the, on the paper. We show up, we do the game, and we leave. They're there for hours before and hours after and take care of us, make us sound good and look as good as they can. Yeah. And uh, we just really uh, appreciate them. Well, Thanks we a lot, guys. We often tell those guys at some point in the year, nobody turns this thing on to listen to what we have to say. They turn it on to see the pictures you put on and sound and so on that you put together. And we really appreciate what you do. Our other bright spot, Mark, and we're going to head into basketball a little bit later on. We've got some stuff here about Delphi St. John's and celebrating their 100th year of boys basketball wow. at Delphi St. John's. They started way back in 1919 when they were 2-1. and one. <laughs> You know, a winning record, obviously, and through so all the great things that are going to happen there. A DSJ, his record is 660, 676 wins, 291 losses. Wow. They have a, a 1983 state championship. Coach Arns, of course, uh, ranked sixth all time, and a lot of great things are going to go at DSJ. Paul Sadler, the class of 1992, and one of our guys we see broadcasting yep. occasionally. He's putting together a record and a list of things that have happened in 99 years of, of basketball so far with DHA basketball. basketball. You want to contact Paul if you've got some information or Aaron Elwer over at Delphi St. John's. That's a great event. Oh, man. what a storied program. They'll have a lot of fun with that. Well-deserved. They really do. And we'll try to cover some of that through the course of the season as we have a chance to do with basketball here as well. Well, we're going to take a break. And when we come back, we're going to do something special. We're going to do some highlights of the Telestrator board. Right after this, you're watching a closer look on WOSN. We're back on a closer look, and we've made the journey all the way over there from Studio A to Studio B <laughs> so that we can look at the big board here yeah. and have a chance for Mark Miller to diagram some plays. And Mark, typically when you think of Mary and Local, you think this is a guy who's going to run the football, they're going to run it right down your throat. They do that very well, but we saw yeah. them execute the two-minute drill very well the other night. Yeah. Take us through some plays. This in the second quarter against Liberty Benton. I think this is why they're going to have a step up in that state final against Kirtland, because they run and pass Kirtland basically just a running team. So they got trips to the field, and the first route that they're going to have, and this is Bruns, he's going to hit Ruin Camp. And what they do is they take three levels on the outside. 
The outside guy is going to run deep. The middle guy is going to run an intermediate route. And the inside guy right here is going to run into the flat. Bruns is reading the cornerback. If he steps up, he's going to throw to one of the deep guys. You always say, check the deep one first. You want the home run before you want the short one. And let's go ahead and run it, and let's just see what Nathan Bruns does. There you go. Deep, intermediate. See the corner step up on the flat? He throws to the intermediate guy. That's Ruin Camp for a big first down. Now they're going to run a post. They're going to take Ruin Camp and break him inside, hit the void between the linebackers and the safeties. Another big play right at the first down marker. Here's just going to throw an out back to the weak side. Look at the arm on that guy, Bruns. Down and out, throw it in front of the corner. Here we go with a clear out and a crossing route. They run those guys off, run him across into the void, and that's another big gain. And now the fifth play in our series is going to be a little bit of a play action. They're going to roll out, throw the screen back, look at the blockers out in front, untouched into the end zone. That is great play calling. Great play design and great execution by Bruns and his group of receivers. Yeah, if you look at this, it starts with 2.30 on the clock. They score with a minute 10, and they had a penalty in there, too. Yeah. So uh, a great yeah. job of running that thing, and certainly Marion Loco in the passing game. Much, much better, I think, than some people give him credit for. I think so, too. And that, shot, that throw right there, that post into the void, that takes arm strength. And right here, if you can throw the out in high school football, you can march it all the way down the field because kids don't want to roll up too much. This is a great play design. Two guys going deep, and look at how open. And that's Tangeman in yeah. there. I didn't mention him. He's the one that caught the out the play before, too. And Habadaz, Nolan, the running back, catches the screen for a touchdown. Look at the great blocking over here. Watch the big guys getting out and getting. There's a double team block right there. Tansman gets Tansman the block. working in the end. And they put it in the end zone. Yeah, thanks, Mark. For putting that together. Yeah, really appreciate that. Well, when we come back, an annual event on a closer look, the famous big chair switch, and we move to high school basketball. We're back after this. You're watching a closer look on WOSN. Welcome back to A Closer Look. Mark Schein, my good friend Mark Miller. We appreciate the guys putting that stuff together over there and we had a chance to do it on the big board. Well now, uh, kind of an annual event, even though it's only the second one, we could easily have come back from that event and changed chairs, but yeah, no. no. Our tradition. crowd, our, our tradition, we're very big on that here. It's time for the big chair switch as we switch captain's role and pilot's role with each other and we go from lead to whatever you call it, there two guard go. or whatever, All let's right. switch. Well, out with football and in with basketball. And I got the expert over in the expert chair now. Oh, expert chair, okay. All right, so we All switched right. it up, and now we're going to turn our attention to basketball. The girls opened up last weekend. The boys open up Friday night. We'll be at the tip-off classic. Yes, we will. And we want to look, as we always do at the beginning of a season, we did it with football, we'll do it with basketball. There are some new coaches in our area, yep. and a lot of them up north, Coach Shine. Not nearly as many as we've had in the past, but if you look, uh, first of all, down at Continental, Curtis Brown left at Continental, replaced by Eric Mag. Now, he was the interim coach a year ago for Ryan Steckshoulde at Columbus Grove. Good to see him get involved as well. And then we've got a move down. Keith Utendorf left Fort Jennings and went over to Ottoville and replaced Todd Turnwald there. He's replaced by Ryan Schrader. And of course, Ryan has some coaching experience in our area as well. A couple other changes, uh, Adam Burris, Todd Turnwell, of course, is out. And then Mark Bishop left at Van Buren. Yeah, after a great year. After a great yeah. year. Tremendous couple years up there. Replaced by Tyler Niekamp. Now, Tyler Niekamp, that name looks familiar to oh, you. Oh, yeah. He's from a pretty good coaching tree, <laughs> I would think. He played at Fort Recovery. His brother is the football coach at Fort Recovery, Brent Niekamp. He is the nephew of Ron Niekamp. Now, Tyler also played at Finley University, not for Ron, of course, but a nephew, nephew of a long time and very successful coach, uh, Ron Niekamp at, uh, at uh, University of Finley. And that's our list of new coaches in the area, Mark, and not nearly as many as last year, but some new guys that's looking right. at new positions. Well, Bishop was a Finley guy, too, yes, so it'll, it'll right. keep that thing rolling there at uh, Van Buren. And we have a, from good uh, sources that Mike Lee is assistant coach now. Wow. At Van Buren. He came, had a chance that to move on and move to Finley. Yeah. That would be a great guy to have on your staff, yeah. a new coach, wouldn't it? Sure would. That sure would. All he right. won't be broadcasting with us, though, if he's working with them. Well, maybe we can him do both. There you there go. go. And every year we got rule changes All right. in the offseason. The, the organizations and, uh, and associations look at rules and try to improve the game. Mark, what do you got this year? Well, first of all, uh, not much in the way of the things that are really noticeable. The coach's box is bigger now. It's now 28 feet instead of 14 feet. 
and it starts from the baseline and goes towards midcourt. Now, if you don't see a line on down for your coach's box, then you can't have one. So, you know, every coach in AD is going to put one down. The only difference is if there's some type of reason, like the scorer's table is offset and you can't get a full 28 feet in, both teams have to be the same in their length of coach's box. And my favorite coach's box line came from Chris Adams. Back in the old day when the coach's box was only six foot long, and Chris said, I'm five foot ten, I can't even lay down inside it. <laughs> anyway. Yogi Berra. There you go. All right, officials also now, you look at colleges and you look at the uh, professional level, they report fouls with both hands. High school used to do it with just the right hand. Now it's with both hands, and the idea was to prevent confusion. Okay. Yeah, I know. I'm not sure yeah. that's supposed to work out. It's going to be right hand for the, <laughs> That's right. <laughs> right hand for the tens number, left hand for the ones number. And that's it. We've got some new things about, about the uniforms we're going to skip over because nobody likes to talk about those things anymore. We have something that's a little bit new. You can now officially warn a coach and bench behavior. Now, what that means is you can actually call timeout. Go to the scores table, say I'm warning Coach A at 2.31 in the second quarter, put it in the scorebook. It doesn't have to be done before giving a technical foul. It's just one more tool for coaches. I got a good warning. Yeah, that's, that's a real good <laughs> warning. It used to be just did this. Okay, I got the stop sign, Coach. We've had enough. We've now added this one as well. And one other thing, it's the mercy rule. Okay, now, oddly enough, it is only in the tournament, not in the regular season. If the point differential reaches 35 or more in a tournament game, now this is OHSAA tournament, not one of those holiday tournaments like uh -huh. we're going to see this weekend, um, the, the running clock begins and it will continue unless the point differential goes below 30, and then we'll go back to a regularly timed uh, event, but again, only in the tournament. All right. All Thanks, right. Coach Shine. Now let's look at our, our teams league by league. You know, we'll look at what they did last year and then try to predict a little bit of what, what ha might happen this year. But that's the fun of high it school is. sports. Yes. New kids that we don't even know their names yet are going to come on and have great years and teams will get better. But anyway, we're going to start with the WBL and Coach Shine. All right, let's start with the Western Buckeye League where the champion a year ago was Ottawa Glendorf. They were 9-0. and They were 20-2 and in the regular season. And everybody thought those guys were a year ahead of schedule and they were. Their best player, Jay Kaufman, was player of the year in the league a year ago as a junior. Now we know he suffered a knee injury, did not play in football, Mark. Now we've been told he's healthy now, he's practicing, and they assume to get him back over the Christmas break. That's a, pl a plus if they get him back. They have a second teamer from a year ago, all-conference Jake Dybul in the post, a huge man. Yeah. And their point guard, Owen Eagle, made tremendous progress as the year went along last year. He will be a junior this year, and I think OG will be a definite threat. Now, Ottawa Glendorf. Uh, was 9-0. Wapak was 8-1 last year. They had a loss to OG. They've got second team, uh, uh, Kyle Huffman graduated, but they've got first teamer Nick Schoonover back. A very balanced team, a lot of three ball shooters. Otto, uh, Elida should be very good. They were 6-3 a year ago. They've got Daniel Unruh back, who was a first team all-conference player, helped lead them to the regional tournament. And Isaac McAdams. Watch out for Van Wert. Jacob Kelly's back. He was a second team all-conference a year ago. Um, that does some very good teams at the top. Two really huge games in that conference at the end of the year. OG goes to Wapak on February 16th. Elida goes to OG, to OG the last weekend of the year. Those could well be the games that decide that conference this year in the Western Buckeye League. And we may be there. And That's we the may case. be there. That's correct. Let's look at the Midwest Athletic Conference. you got to start with Versailles. They were 9-0 last year. Finished 25-1 on that great year. Player of the year, Justin Arns, the Ohio State commit. A.J. Arns, his brother, brother yep. played really well. The game that we did, just a big, strong guy inside. And we kind of think Versailles may be the best team in the area. We'll see how healthy OG gets in a hurry. Marion Local, 7-2. and two, They went to the regional semis. Tyler Mesher and Nathan Bruns, their two leaders from last year, both return coming off the, the, the football team. We'll see what kind of start they get. And then Delphi St. John's, 21-4. and four, They made it all the way to the state semis. Yep. They did lose 6-foot-8-inch Tim Krieger. But they return all Mac Jared Worst, who's coming off a good football season. And in that league, it's always interesting to see how long it takes the football guys to flip it over and really get going in yeah, basketball. You don't know who's good in that conference to get to the middle yeah. of January. Yeah. And then you're going to have some strange Saturday night losses because you've got guys that have been playing 13, 14 mm -hmm. football games that go right into basketball. And 
They just yeah. have that game where you go, oh, man, we just don't have it right. tonight. So yeah. it, it's a really difficult thing in that particular conference. And anybody who has to go deep into the football playoffs. That's right. Yep. All right. You and, got the Northwest Conference. And by the way, before we leave that, yeah. you want to watch a good lady play? Go watch Cammie McEldowney from Versailles. That young lady can flat out play basketball. Now, there's a lot of good ones in that conference, and she's one of them. Okay, let's go to the Northwest Conference where Crestview uh, was the champion a year ago. and uh, Or they're my pick, I should say, to be the champion this year. Spencerville was 8-0 a year ago, but they graduated Dakota Pritchett. Richard, Bailey Croft, Griffin Croft, a lot of good players. They'd be tough for Coach Sensiball to match what they did a year ago. So I'm going to go with Crestview this year. They were second a year ago. They were 7-1 in conference play. They lost by two to Spencerville. Uh, we did that particular game. What a great game that was a year ago. They've got Javon Essler back. He's still just a junior. He already has Division I offers. He's listed about 6'5 or 6'6. He can flat fill it up. Derek Stout was a second team all-conference player a year ago. He's back. He's just a junior. And who's their point guard? Drew Klein, and he's a junior. So the better things are yet to come, but this is still going to be a very, very good year for Crestview. Lincoln View, that's a team we might look at as well. They were 4-4 four and four in conference play a year ago, but they have two second-team all-conference players back. Caden Ringwald and Clayton Overholt, they're both back, so Lincoln View could be headed to a good year. And also a young player is going to come on. Luke Denneker started last year at point guard for Bluffton. He's back. He was just a freshman last year and made first-team all-conference. Wow. We'll see what Bluffton can do with him. A lot of other teams got some unknowns, uh, Ada and Allen East, and, and uh, some of those teams are a little bit unknown right now. And how will Spencerville play? But a lot of good teams in the Northwest Conference this year, too. Let's go to the PCL. Pandora Gilboa won it last year with a 6-1 record. They return their player of the year, Drew Johnson. They also get Jared Brees, who's just had a phenomenal football season. Will carry over from a successful football year, work its way into basketball. We see that every, every year. year. They gain confidence. A lot of the same players, or at least the leaders, are playing basketball. that had a great fall, and they just continue on and have a great basketball season. Miller City was second last year. We think they're going to be the top two teams again this year. They finished at 5-2. and two. They have all PCL Mark Kuhlman back. So those are the two teams, at least going in, we expect to be at the top. Okay, let's move on now to the Northwest Central Conference. You're looking for a favorite? Flip a coin, because lots and lots of very good players graduated from a year ago. And who's got JV kids coming up? Who's got young players who have developed over the year? And right now, it's kind of anybody's race. Perry, of course, was 7-0 a year ago, had that great tournament run as well, but they lost four very talented players. Jacoby Lane Harvey, who was player of the year in the conference, Kobe Glover, who was first team all conference, and then second teamers, Orion Monford, who had a tremendous tournament a year ago, and second team, Plummy Gardner. They all graduated. Perry, unknown, but could yeah. be really good again because Coach Tabor does a good job with their program over there. USV, they were 5-2 and two in the conference a year ago, finished second, but they graduated two first-team players, Trevor Dotson and Chase Rose. Temple Christian graduated some guys. They've got their point guard back in Brody Bowman, who's just a junior this year, and it started for them for a couple years. But in that conference, is it Lehman? Is it Perry? Does Riverside come through with some good athletes they had during the football program? Right now, the whole NWCC, let's just start playing basketball and figure who's got the best team in the conference because it's wide open right now. That makes it exciting. Let's go to the track. It was a Toledo race last year. Toledo St. John's, 13-1. Player of the Year, Vincent Williams returns. They won the league by three games, yep. so they really were the class of the track last year. Whitmer and St. Francis ended up in second places, place, both with 10 and 4 records. Let's look at our more local teams. Lima Senior came in fourth at 9 and 5. They got the big fella, Keaton Upshaw, back. Also, junior uh, Jaleel King was an all-track player last year. He'll be back to lead them. And then Finley finished at 8 and 6, and they're looking to get better. So they got to break into that Toledo group this year to get a track title. Now, you know, I'm a Lima guy. I, live, I see a lot of people around Lima. There's a big rumor floating around Lima that Keaton Upshaw has decommitted from Kentucky football and is going to go to Auburn and play basketball. Now, that's a rumor time. You know, I don't know how, we, how much stock you want to put into that, but he is a well, big-time football player. that's the case, he's going to have a heck of a basketball that's season. That's right. If he's going to Auburn to play basketball, he's got a great year. They've also got eligibility for the guys who moved in a year ago were not eligible to play. One of them is back, so they might be able to add something uh, to the Spartan program as well. I like what Jim Rookie does up at Finley. Every year they just execute so well offensively and defensively. It'll be another great year in that league as well. Well, let's go to the BVC then, where Liberty Benton was a champion last year. They were 11-0 in conference play. Why? Because they defeated Van Buren in a game you and I did with Jerry Snodgrass. There was 63-58, but they graduated player of the year. Anthony Masterlasco is now at the University of Finley. They do return a second-team all-conference player in Austin May. 
who now is a big, strong young man at quarterback, but can shoot the ball very well as, as from a three-point line, and we'll see if he doesn't develop into their, their go-to guy this year, much like Master Lasko was a year ago. Van Buren graduated their guys. They were 10-1. and one. They graduated Braxton for Sony and Ryan Turner. They lost their coach, as we saw earlier, Mark Bishop, now replaced by Tyler Niekamp. It might well be, and you mentioned them in the, in the Putnam County League, it might be Pandora Gilboa's turn for Coach Joe Bradick. They returned Drew Johnson, as Mark said. He was first team all-conference. Jared Brees is back. He was second team all-conference. They've got, got that nucleus, as you mentioned, a, mere, a, year, a little while ago. They were 8-3 and three a year ago, and this could be their year. Drew Johnson can flat out play. He's been doing so since his sophomore year. He's back now as, as a senior, and he could well be the, the key player in that particular conference. Lipsick graduated a couple guys, Grant Schrader and Jordan Berger. They've got uh, things to replace. Two guys who are back, and we kind of got to look at from an individual standpoint. Uh, Julian Hegemeyer at North Baltimore, one of those guys who can score whenever he touches the basketball. He was a second-team all-conference. Also was Eric Ritter from Corey Rosson, another second-team all-conference player. Those are two guys to watch as they return and try to lead their teams up into conference matches as well. And then one more, Mark, because they don't actually play in a conference. Let's look at the Lima Central Catholic Thunderbirds, who we'll have a chance to see this weekend mm -hmm. uh, at the tip-off classic. They, of course, graduated Thomas Williams from a team that went just 6 and 16 in the regular season, but they returned some really good players. Mark Janowski, their 6'8 senior center, is back uh, from a year ago, and we'll see if he has bulked up and can continue to improve what his game. They have five other seniors in their program. Their sophomore point guard is back in Biggs Johnson. This could be a rebound year for LCC, and of course it's difficult for them not playing in a conference, yeah. you know, going all over the place, trying to schedule games, sometimes on odd nights, and they don't have that conference schedule to play for, but it's a team that builds for the tournament. Well, if they can do in basketball, what happened in go. football yep. with an infusion of a couple of young, very talented guys. Yep. They can make the turnaround just like football. And will that success carry over carry for over. LCC right. like it may at PG and some other it schools? It could well do. Got a yeah. trivia question for you. Do right. a little research this week as we headed towards the tip-off classic. Which team has won the tip-off classic a lot of the most times? I'd say LCC. LCC has yeah. won it the most times. How about coach? Yeah. Want to guess? Well, Coach, well, yeah. if you're going to go with LCC, I guess you got to go with Segerson. And it's a tie. Is Segerson it? and Chris Adams both won that thing seven times. And, you know, that thing has started back, what, now? This will be the 28th I th year. Well, I thought it was 29, but okay. it is either 28 or 9. Right. And I think this is the 31st year that WOSN, formerly WTLW, with all our broadcasts, will be doing high school basketball. So that. we've been around for quite a long time, and that begs the question. Okay. Um, I've mentioned that Versailles may very well be the best team in this area. Right. Regardless of division, what other teams do you look for? We talked about them league by league. Let's yep. mix them all together, and what are the best teams if we had a tournament, if, a if, Lima Land tournament? Well, if you're looking at best team in March, it could well be uh, Ottawa Glendorf yeah. be because if they get Jay Kaufman back and he gets healthy, and think about this. Suppose they play the month of December without him. Okay, and now you, you get used to You're only going to play one conference game anyway in December. They get used to playing without him. Everybody else has to step up and do more. Right. And then you add him to the mix for January, February in the tournament, that they could be really, really good. Yeah. I, I like what PG does, as I mentioned a moment yeah. ago. They could be really good, too, down in one of the lower divisions. Yeah. But I think those three teams, and we'll just see how things develop. Injuries, of course, play a big factor in sure. things, and we'll see how things go. Well, it's going to be an exciting year. It starts this weekend, at, and we'll put up our broadcast schedule in a minute. There you see uh, the games that we start off on Friday. It's Temple and Ottoville, LCC and Bath. And then Saturday, we get the Shawnee, Elida Parkway, Waynesfield, Goshen, Wapakoneta, Indian Lake. Everybody's starting to get going. Uh, the tip-off championship and consolation coming your way on Saturday and Sunday. Bath and Grove. Delphi, St. John's, and Perry. Everybody's starting their non-league schedule. Yep. We don't get into the league schedule a little bit later. We got a couple of cool things that we're trying to organize for you this year. The last couple of years, three years, I think, we've yep. had Jerry Snodgrass, assistant commissioner of the OHSA, join Mark and I for a broadcast. That's always a highlight of our year. Jerry loves to come back. He used to sit in that chair with us yeah. on a regular basis. Right. Now down in Columbus, he gets to come back and at least sit in as a guest with us. But he brings with him all of the information and all of the initiatives and the things to look at further down the road uh, through the OHSAA. And uh, we're, we're trying to identify the game that Jerry can get yeah. up and be with us there. And Mike Shep, our old buddy that used to uh, kind of mentor Mark and I and all the other young announcers as we came on, we're hoping to get him uh, on uh, with us uh, for a game or two. And Mike's uh, facing a surgery here soon, so we wish him nothing but a quick recovery to get back, and we'll get him behind the mic uh, as well. So, Mark, uh, it's going to be a lot yep. of fun uh, starting off this week at the tip-off. What better way than a 
preseason tournament. Absolutely, and, and I know Coach Sagerson always said this, we appreciate your support now in November, early December. We really appreciate your support when we get to the middle of January and February and things get tough. I think that's always a good thing for Coach Sagerson to remember. Well, you hear a lot of coaches say it's two seasons. Yeah. You know, before the holidays and after the holidays. Correct. Is it is it broken that way or is it non-league league? How did you uh, well, break it Well, because up? most of the teams only play a single game or maybe two at the most in before Christmas. Yeah, I think you're right. You're really looking at league season starts January 1 and you carry it on out through there. I know the track and the BBC have to play games a little bit earlier because of the number of games they play in their conference schedule. Most teams just play once before the break. So really, yep, it starts after Christmas and you want to get to the holidays playing as best you can, develop over that Christmas break and then really hit it in January. Well, it's definitely time to go into yep. a temperature controlled gym and play some basketball. We'll report on our state championships next week, but it's basketball all the way from here on out. Looking forward to it, yep. Coach Shine. We'll be in these chairs again next week. We're glad you joined us. Come on back next week for a closer look with Mark and Mark.